Pioneer does share the view that rates are biased to move upward over the medium to long term. In fact, we may be a little bit ahead of consensus in that view because we do think that there are motive forces in the economy now that will lead the Fed to tighten policy sooner rather than later. Now let's look at some of the reasons why the Fed might be tightening policy. Recall, the Fed's mandate is of a dual nature, including both employment and inflation objectives. So, first we're seeing a very slow improvement on the employment front, but it is an improvement nonetheless. The unemployment rate has moved below the target level that they had initially communicated of 6.5%, and now we're starting to see the participation rate start to move up. That's all good. Second is inflation. Overall, we're still seeing very low inflation in core CPI by historic standards. But let's dig deeper. We see some troublesome inflation trends happening now. Commodity-related inflation makes up about 40% of the number. And if we took that out, inflation would actually be above 3%. With the housing recovery and general services already putting upward pressure on prices, we could expect to see an uptick in overall inflation, which then runs counter to the Fed's objective of maintaining inflation at about a 2% target. Now recall, the Fed is targeting inflation at about 2%, but they only have influence over part of that equation. They have influence over the domestic economy, which shows up in housing and in service prices. They have very little influence over commodity prices. Now, in addition to employment and inflation, there are other reasons to be worried a bit about the possibility of rates moving upward. Chief among them is the growth rate in the U.S. economy. Our view is that growth in 2014 should step up to the 25 to 3% range. And that's for real growth, not nominal growth. Now, that's after a very weak first quarter, too. So we're really looking at faster growth over the remainder of the year. But nominal 10-year yields tend to track the sum of core CPI plus the real growth rate. That's a critical equation. When you add those up, we're looking at three and three quarters to 4% nominal 10-year rates, which is a full 100 basis points or more above where we are now. To the extent that growth surprises to the upside or inflation surprises to the upside, there's even more reason for the nominal 10-year rate to be higher than where it is at this point. So that is really the crux of the issue for many investors, that the underlying strength of the economy is inconsistent with the 10-year rate at these levels. We see that, to some degree, there are risks and valuations, which would be sort of the third leg of the stool after the Fed and after the growth story. What we are seeing is negative real rates in the short end of the yield curve, out in the one to five-year part. That historically has not been a sustainable situation for very long. So, When we do see negative real rates at the short to intermediate part of the yield curve, we have concerns about potential mean reversion in that range, which would then push those rates higher. And so, from the investor's perspective, there's not a lot of room for upside from taking a long-duration position. Particularly in the belly of the yield curve, rates cannot drop a lot, but rates can certainly rise a lot. Investors are faced with an unattractive investment proposition there. This should force investors to move out of duration risk and into other risks in building their portfolios, and that ultimately is bearish for rates. To understand the implications of a tighter Fed policy, it's instructive to look at Fed tightening cycles in the entire post-war period. But let's focus on the most recent cycles, which occurred in 1988, 1994, 1999, and 2004. In each case, when the Fed started to tighten policy, what followed was the expected rise in Treasury rates, but of more significance to the investor was a significant flattening of the yield curve. In some more extreme cases, such as 1999, we saw the yield curve start to invert, in fact. This has important investment implications for fixed income investors. It suggests that the greatest risk in fixed income, if they're concerned about rising rates through Fed tightening, is in the short to medium part of the yield curve. It is not in the long end of the yield curve. What we've seen in past tightening cycles has been a relatively stable 30-year rate. In fact, in the last tightening cycle, 
that ran from 2004 to 2006, the 30-year actually rallied. It ended up lower than where it started before the Fed started tightening rates. Rather, it was a short end of the curve that bore the brunt of the tightening. We begin with the premise that there will always be some need for most investors to have fixed income in their portfolios as a risk anchor, no matter if they are bearish on rates. In that scenario, investors will often look to reallocate just their fixed income sleeve in order to reduce their exposure to rising rates. The typical investor response in this case is to shorten duration. In our view, that by itself is not sufficient. Simply shortening duration tends to move investors out of intermediate to long duration securities and into short duration securities. As we've pointed out, in past tightening cycles, it is the short end of the curve, such as the one to five year part, that underperforms most dramatically as the market prices in future Fed tightening. So, in fact, when investors move into those short durations, they're actually moving into the most exposed part of the fixed income market. There are several other approaches to sidestepping duration risk besides simply shortening duration that would be more effective defenses in a Fed tightening cycle. These would include first adding floating rate assets outright. Floating rate assets will have coupons that reset upward as the Fed starts to tighten rates at the short end. And so they will maintain their net asset value quite well, and their coupons will provide greater income as they reset upward. In addition, we suggest that investors barbell their portfolios. Some of this is accomplished by adding floating rate assets, but also by moving assets either into very short duration, fixed rate, say sub one year duration, or else adding very long duration, typically in the 10 to 30 year part of the curve. These are the most defensive areas in a tightening cycle. Another alternative for investors is to replace duration with other fixed income risk. Fixed income is often perceived as purely duration play, but in fact, there are a number of other risks that come into play in investing in fixed income. If one is invested only or mostly in treasuries, then yes, it is really a question of one's duration posture. But much of the investable universe is made up of securities that have other risks, such as investment grade and high yield corporates that have credit risk, mortgage backed securities with prepayment and volatility risk, and non dollar bonds with currency risk. So, there are a number of other risks that will be advantageous to the investor should rates rise because they won't move in lockstep. In other words, investors can move into investment alternatives that are more credit-based or really take advantage of other fixed income risks in order to avoid duration risk. Finally, an appropriate response to rising rates is to build portfolios that add carry, that is coupon income, in order to build a cushion against rising rates. By moving into higher yielding securities and holding those positions over meaningful investment horizons, let's say one to three years, the carry or coupon income itself builds up a return cushion that will offset some of the potential principal loss due to rising rates. Now, to see why it's advantageous to move out of a pure index or pure treasury portfolio, let's look back 10 years at historic correlations between different fixed income sectors. We'll see that many fixed income sectors have surprisingly low return correlations with treasuries. Investment grade corporates are at 0.46, municipals at 0.31, non-US investment grade bonds at 0.5, and EM bonds at 0.3. So those are all sectors that have correlations well below one. Compare these to agency debentures as an example, which have a very high correlation to treasuries at 0.93. If we are in a tightening cycle with treasuries underperforming significantly, the lower correlation sectors 
should perform relatively well if historic relationships persist. Some sectors, such as floating rate asset-backed securities, leveraged bank loans, convertibles, and high yield have actually had negative correlations historically. That is, they've produced positive returns when treasuries have had negative returns. With their negative correlations, they provide an excellent cushion to rising treasury rates with the condition that future correlations adhere to the behavior we've seen over the last 10 years. Despite our concerns about investors moving too heavily into short duration funds, we also see that some of the short duration assets can perform fairly well in rising rate environments. Our caution is primarily focused on very short to intermediate treasury assets where, in our view, the carry via coupon is insufficient to offset the potential price depreciation due to rising rates. In general, we would be very cautious on moving into the belly of the yield curve, but sectors like these that are primarily floating rate and have significant carry advantages can significantly outperform in rising rate environments. They benefit from the increase in coupons. They have very short effective durations, and they are biased to enjoy some spread tightening when rates do rise in the treasury market. So, given those measures, they all have the potential to produce very good total returns in a rising rate environment.